this is a, this is a lead into every fight gets bigger, bigger, more competitive. Tonight, I'm ringside at a UFC fight with Ari Emanuel, the newest kingpin of combat sports. He's one of Hollywood's biggest power brokers, the longtime CEO of the entertainment empire Endeavor, and more recently, global sports giant TKO. With a career spanning four decades, the straight-talking dealmaker has a reputation for getting what he wants and saying exactly what he thinks. What is no, the I don't think that's that people the are going to end up at. No, I, that, that's not the question. Last time I interviewed <laughs> Ari, it was in a room and he got in a fight with a guy in the I didn't room. actually get in a fight. The you guy kind of started approaching and I was ready to go. I don't give a what you do. You don't want to pick up any of my shows? Go with God. Emmanuel has built an impressive roster of A-list clients, repping some of the most recognizable names in show business. He was even the real-life inspiration for Ari Gold in the cult series Entourage. I'm back, and you're fired. I know you've said you never paintballed The Office, but what was the closest thing? I know you're not going to believe this, <laughs> but um, I really didn't watch a lot of them only because it gave me such anxiety. But I was back then really crazy. I was trying to build a business. We were the smallest player. You, you didn't fight over price. When people didn't play fairly with us in the sandbox, I didn't put up with that that much, even though we weren't the biggest player. I mean, I was, I was aggressive. That's all I'll say. Emmanuel has worked tirelessly to transform Endeavor into a multi-billion dollar behemoth that straddles the worlds of entertainment, live events, sports, and the arts. In 2023, he made his biggest bet yet, bringing two combat sports into the same ring with TKO. There's the unscripted martial arts-fueled UFC and the WWE, where pro wrestlers fight, but with scripted storylines, personalities, and entertaining costumes. I'm here in Las Vegas to get shown the ropes on what it takes to become the ultimate fighter. Two ropes, ropes, fast, fast. Nice, nice, ah! nice. A little more. Get him up, get him up, get him up, get him up. If you want to go a little faster, it wouldn't break my heart. That's no joke. No joke. And I talked to Emmanuel about what's next for Endeavor, the future of Hollywood, and how live combat sports became the unlikely crown jewel. A young Emanuel was first singled out as one to watch by The Hollywood Reporter in 1994, when he was working for talent agency ICM. Just a year later, he and three colleagues left to set up the rival agency Endeavor. Full disclosure, I've been a client of Endeavor's for 15 years. You started the agency above a burger joint with yeah. a few colleagues in Beverly Hills. Yeah. When you look back on your upbringing, and I know you have so many amazing, you know, so many crazy stories about growing up, is there like one secret thing? What is the thing that made you, you? My parents gave me a great upbringing. They enabled us to make mistakes. They enabled us to be curious. They didn't program us all day long. And then as you went out, you kind of then picked up your own skills and built on the foundation that they gave you. You know, you have to work hard. You have to be curious. You have to have endurance, emotional endurance. And those are just things that take time. So over the years, you represented the biggest names. How did repping these big name clients day in and day out prepare you for the sort of high stakes game of running Endeavor? I'm not a wallflower. I just kind of act the way I want to act. Hopefully, I'm, I, I think I'm a pretty honest guy and a pretty upfront guy. When you're trying to break things up and kind of create new businesses, you have to be pretty forceful and, and not get deterred if you have a vision for it. So. You know, those are things that you need to do when you're putting projects together for clients or trying to sign a client. And so I just used those skill sets that I had as an agent and moved them over. When you bought the UFC, people said you were crazy. The value has since tripled. Right. What do you say to those people now? Oh, I don't really care what those people say. <laughs> I really don't. I always thought that live sports and television that there was going to be more distribution and content was going to be more valuable and brands were going to become more valuable. It's proven to be true. You've brought the UFC and WWE together now in this massive $21 billion deal. You know, what's the vision? And, and how does it all fit together with a talent agency? TKO is live sports, the whole league, 52 weeks a year, pure play. The representation business at EDR is all the other assets that had already existed. 
before we pulled the UFC out. It's clean, easier for the street to understand it on the TKO side. And so I think that's kind of the two businesses. Emmanuel cares about an easy story for TKO because his other company, Endeavor, has faced some serious whiplash on Wall Street. In 2019, Emmanuel pulled the plug on the company's IPO the day before its debut. We weren't getting the economics that we thought we deserved. We also realized we had to align our shareholders and our stockholders in the UFC and make it one entity. It finally went public two years later. Now, in another twist, it's going back to being a private company. Why didn't Endeavor work as a public company? I don't think they understood, and I didn't do a good job, of explaining the story of what Endeavor was as how it touched all aspects of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so TKO is now a really clean story. It's, you know, sports, sports entertainment. And now Endeavor will be what it's going to be. Now, as part of this go private deal, you have to sell some stuff. So give us a sense of the strategizing that's happening. What will Endeavor be when this is all said and done? I think all the businesses, whether it be TKO, whether it be Endeavor and all the assets in Ende are great businesses. What remains, doesn't remain, will play itself out over the next couple of years, I guess. I don't, I don't really know the time frame, And so, Whatever is left, I'm going to be around for. Whatever doesn't, I'll probably be really sad. I try to teach my kids this. I try to teach the employees this. It's about not how many punches you can throw. It's about how many punches you can take. Hmm. Even though you love something, it's tough. And uh, endurance is an important quality for anybody now running a public company, starting a business. And so... Um, I've built my endurance up. Before we bought UFC, they were building this facility. And when we closed, we finished this facility, but this was Dana and Lorenzo and Frank's vision mm -hmm. to build a performance institute to give back to the fighters so what's the real goal of a performance institute like? So you have rehab in here. Mm -hmm. You have food preparation for them. Mm -hmm. You have training programs. I had a pretty tough workout this morning. You did. With Forrest. You are one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. Um, no, but, but I usually don't correct people when they say that. <laughs> but you are a Hall of Famer. I am. Tell me about the psychology of it, because yes. it's, it's as physical as it is mental, right? Yeah, or as mental as it is physical, yeah. How do you stay present and focused? How do you realize that when you have competition anxiety, that's natural, that's normal, that's a good thing. That's your body getting ready to explode. But how do you control that so it does not control you, right? How do you use that as your fuel and not let it become fear, which is a word I never like to use. So you're gonna show me what it takes to be an elite fighter? Uh, no. I'm gonna take you through a metabolic conditioning circuit. Okay. Like I said, no mercy. Let's do it. She keeps saying that. <laughs> go, go, go. Faster, faster. Look out, camera guy. You love these ropes. Ah, respect for these people, man. Woo! How's your leg sore? I'm, I'm all sore. I came down here and I did a training, not fighting, to see where my VO2 max was and everything mm -hmm. with them, just to kind of get my numbers. You'll ask them how I yeah. did. So I did pretty well. You're always doing like 17 things to stay healthy. What's the new, new thing? There's a thing we have here. I have a chair called the shift wave, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Cause I'm into the, not to the extreme of body hacking, but I do a lot of body hacking. Every time some, I find something new, I try it. As long as I, I make a call to my brother Zeke, who's the doctor, and I said, okay, can it kill me? If the answer after he does some work and research and I talk to a lot of people mm -hmm. says no, I do it. What about your mental fitness? Because this sport is super physical, but also super, mm -hmm. super mental. Right. How do you prepare yourself to go into your own arena? 
Well, I mean, I mean, after I do, I wake up in the morning, I work out, I do what I do. I go into a sauna, I meditate for 20 minutes, and then do all the crazy stuff that I do. After that, ice baths and craziness. I get on the shift wake and I meditate some more. And um, that's probably it. Having an elite fitness routine might be the best preparation for dealing with the high stakes business of combat sports. Both the UFC and WWE are at the top of their game in delivering primetime entertainment for highly engaged fandoms around the world. But to some outsiders, you're kind of running Fight Club. How do you feel about that? I don't think it's Fight Club. I mean, I remember watching the WWE when I was, WWF actually, when I was young. Paul's done an amazing job at the WWE with Raw, SmackDown, PLEs, NXT. And UFC is a sport that Dana created over 30 years ago. Didn't exist, his vision. It's now a global sport. You don't really have to explain the rules uh, of the UFC to anybody in the world. Um, and we'll grow more sports out of the UFC. More sports like what? I don't know, you know, I, I don't know the sports that are out there right now that we would do. There's nothing on the horizon right now. This is enough for us to do right now if we do what we do, and we're, I think we're executing really, really well, so. While the NBA and MLB have long been staples of global sports culture, after years of being underground, the UFC is now part of the mainstream. Its core audience of young men and alignment with right-wing media personalities has given the UFC its own niche in the zeitgeist. Let's go! Let's get Let's it! Go! Summer Slam 2024! Meanwhile, the WWE has broader, family-friendly appeal. I got friends across the aisle, we're all different um, philosophies, man, but when we come to wrestling fans, we come to wrestling shows, we drop that stuff, we drop the politics, and we just have fun and enjoy the show, and that's what it's all about. I love the inclusivity. You see people of all different types, all different backgrounds. I really love that it's inclusive for everyone, and I grew up with it, so that's a bonus. The WWE's influence on pop culture has given its biggest stars unique access into the worlds of Hollywood, music, and even politics. However, key figures from both sports have faced serious allegations outside the ring, prompting tough action all the way to the top and criticism about the values these sports promote. We need to go back to like taking women out of the workforce. And, and maybe that's, and, and maybe that is where we, maybe that's where we up, you guys. We let women vote, no offense. Some of these guys don't have the best reputations. There's this element that outsiders see of a sort of hyper-masculine culture. Do you want to evolve any of this? There's always been a fight game. Every sport has had difficulty with their athletes. Nobody's perfect. There's some athletes that are great in team sports. We have incredible fighters. If you want to go through every sport and every fighter or every football player or every basketball and things that have gone wrong, mm -hmm. that's not what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. I think all in all, our fighters are really good people, have families, want to feed them. This is a sport they've chosen, mm -hmm. so. How do you approach working with such colorful and controversial characters. When you have guys that are visionaries and take whatever, you know, whatever comes through on the cases with Vince McMahon, who's no longer with the company, and now Paul, Triple H, is, is running that, they understand kind of the heartbeat. The skills I've learned maybe at the talent agency side have helped, but now we're partners. And so that's how uh, I look at it. You just have to let the talent, and they, those guys are talent, do what they do and support them with all the, the things that they need. Earlier this year, the UFC's biggest star, Conor McGregor, pulled out of his comeback clash against Michael Chandler with an injury. President Dana White had to deal with the fallout. This, this is going to the sphere. What's he now, 9-0? Yeah. So McGregor pulling out must have been a bummer, but like you bounced back. Yeah. How'd you do that? Well, How it, much did it talk? <laughs> well, it happens. It's, it's, it's part of the business, you know? When, when was, uh, this sounds insensitive, but when human beings are your product, many things happen. These guys have personal problems. They have injuries. Yes, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it, it, it's a complete pain in the ass, but it's part of the business. Okay, you've been doing this for 25 years. What do you want the next 25 to look like? Well, you know, when we think about this business and you look at 
um, where the television landscape is going, right? So 10 years ago, we'd have to go out and cut 300 different television deals in different spots all around the world. Now as streaming is starting to become a reality, and you know, I say this all the time, I grew up, there was channel three, channel five, channel eight, channel 13. That's gonna exist again, but globally, right? And who's it gonna be? Is it gonna be Amazon? Is it gonna be Disney? Is it gonna be YouTube? Is it gonna be, you know? Who's any, it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? It's big gonna be, it's gonna be all, all of those players are gonna be players. When you think of what the, what's the ceiling on the UFC is we continue to go into all these different markets. The ceiling is 8 billion people. So we can stack a card where, you know, the people in England want to watch, the people in Canada want to watch, Mexico. The list goes on and on. Just days after he was criminally convicted, Trump made his first public appearance at a UFC fight to thunderous applause. Do you think he'll be a regular during the campaign? Well, he's a, he'll be a regular for as long as he's alive. I mean, this guy loves fights. He's a fight fan. Regardless of everything that's going on, he's always appeared. Trump was one of the first people when the UFC wasn't allowed anywhere. Trump opened the Taj Mahal and let the UFC fight. Hey, UFC 303, let's go! The fan, I mean, the fans have just exploded in the last few years. What, what is behind that? It seems that way to people from the outside looking in, but it's been a long, hard grind on the way up. He's being modest. Tons, I'm telling exactly tons. when it, well, I'll tell you, it was building, building. I'll tell you exactly when it exploded. We were all down. He calls me. He says, I don't want to hear this. We're doing a fight. Get me an island. Mm -hmm. And when he put everything on his back and went to Abu Dhabi with our partners in Abu Dhabi and, and put that together, which was crazy, <laughs> right? Fight Island. Going through COVID definitely didn't hurt us. There were no sports on TV except for us. Fights that should have been doing 300,000 buys were doing a million. So, we, and our fan base grew something like 68% during COVID. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is three pounds in the UFC middleweight division. Barrio didn't like that. Have to tell you anything. Yeah. You got it right away. That's the great thing about sport, and it's global. It's a vibe. It's global, though. It's a global sport. And everyone can understand. And everyone can understand. While the UFC has a tried and true playbook, the WWE is constantly evolving, giving rise to different eras defined by their performers and storytelling approaches. The promotion is now in its renaissance era, featuring series star power like Cody Rhodes and the return of wrestling legends like Roman Reigns and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I think it's pretty electrifying. He is like no other, and it's very exciting to see him around still. It's better than the Avengers. It's better than Marvel. What's going to happen? Who's going to come back? After decades on linear television, TKO landed a blockbuster deal to air WWE Raw on Netflix. How big is the Netflix lift going to be for wrestling? And how big will live events be for Netflix? You can see that Netflix wants to be in the live uh, sports business, They in live period. I think um, they will perform very well for them. There's a, a huge chunk of the audience that are WWE fans that are not, right now, based on our research, Netflix subscribers. And if they capture a portion of those, it's a huge win for them and a huge win for us. Mm. Big tech is coming for sports. I mean, it's not just <clears throat> Netflix, but Amazon and YouTube. Do you see a permanent shift here in sports rights from cable and traditional networks to streaming? Well, I think you're gonna have a mix. And if it ends up at Comcast, Warner Brothers, or and, and Disney, or Comcast, Disney, and Amazon, there's going to be a mix that all of us um, that are in live sports uh, do. The UFC's deal with ESPN is coming up. Is it coming to Netflix? No, no. I mean, I, li listen, ESPN has been an incredible partner. First quarter, we'll see, of next year. That's when we first, when, when we can start. We would love to be back at ESPN. They have been incredible to us. Bob Iger's been incredible. Jimmy's been incredible. So we'll start then and, and, uh, and move forward from there. It helps negotiating a sports rights deal when you have Disney CEO Bob Iger and ESPN chief Jimmy Pitaro on speed dial. A good reminder that we're also talking to Ari Emanuel, the super agent who's navigated every twist and turn in the new Hollywood.
more and more celebrities are launching their own businesses and doing side hustles, more endorsements. What's it going to take to be a real player in this new world? So there's going to be places for commercials and sponsorships, but then there's going to be places for stars to own stuff and break new stuff just based on their awareness on social. And that's the same thing true with social stars. So it's just an evolution of kind of the environmental effect that's happening on the linear side. You rep Tyler Perry, who put an $800 million expansion of his studio on hold because of AI. Just how dramatically is AI going to reshape entertainment? And, and will there still be superstars? I don't think right now, if you look at AI, actually the physical energy required to make movies and TV shows at the length quality you need, you're going to need a lot of power. And I think it's, there's going to be some dislocation there with people and services, whether it be costume designers, makeup artists, et cetera. Remember, AI is ones and zeros. You're still going to need creative people. You're still going to need actors. As it relates to breaking new stars, one of the most important things, I think, for that is the movie business. And I do think the movie business is coming back. Not surprisingly, the UFC's debut at the Las Vegas Sphere felt more like a cinematic experience than a traditional fight night. It was the venue's first sporting event, featuring a glittering roster of Mexican heritage fighters and big-name attendees like Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and, naturally, Bob Iger. The AI-powered spectacle offered a glimpse into what the future might hold, or at least the future according to Ari Emanuel. Do you ever look at your career and look at it as one sort of big, long, ultimate fight? I don't look at, the, at a, as a fight. I just, I, it's kind of funny. I'm not a rear view mirror kind of guy. I'm just right now doing what I do, whatever happens based on thoughts and research and, and studying what the next thing will be, it will be. I don't really contemplate it that much. I'm not like nervous about, oh, did I do this right? or you know, what happened here, I, I don't, I don't do that. How long do you want to keep doing this? I mean, you're, you're healthier than most 25 year olds. Well, here's what I would say to you is, I'm still enjoying it. I love my life. Um, I'm lucky, um, I'm privileged. Uh, I've worked really hard for it. If I'm still happy, it's still giving me curiosity and I still feel the energy to do what I'm doing. I'll be doing it. The minute that it's not, I won't be doing it. And the people that are working with me are incredible. It makes my life a lot easier to do the things that I like to do. And if that continues, I'll be around. And the minute they want me out, I'll be out. Maybe one more time. One more time? All right. Do you want to do it again? No, not really. Okay. 